taking plagiarism. Some of you are watching this video as part of a full course, complete with assignments and a syllabus. And some of your teachers have probably assigned writing assignments. Now, you've probably heard a teacher say that you should never plagiarize when you write, because plagiarizing your writing assignments is a serious offense. And that's true. But what is plagiarism, exactly? Plagiarism is taking credit for what other people said or wrote. And we should note that sometimes plagiarism extends beyond even speaking and writing. For example, it's possible to plagiarize a painting or a piece of music, too. I'm going to make a distinction between two kinds of plagiarism that will be relevant if you do writing assignments for this class. Idea plagiarism and language plagiarism. Idea plagiarism occurs when a student knowingly includes somebody else's ideas in a paper without signaling to the reader that somebody else came up with those ideas first. Here's an example of idea plagiarism. Let's imagine that a student reads the article on the left and uses what she learned to write the sentences on the right. Let's read the headline and the first paragraph of the article together. Hackers can tap USB devices in new attacks, researcher warns. USB devices such as keyboards, thumb drives, and mice can be used to hack into personal computers in, in a potentially new class of attacks that evades all known security protections, a top computer researcher revealed on Thursday. And let's imagine that that student includes the sentences on the right in one of her papers for this class. Cybersecurity threats are constantly changing. It is now possible for a hacker to even attack mundane USB devices. The student clearly got the idea for what she wrote from the article, but she didn't mention her source for this information in the paper that she wrote. Readers of her paper could think that she's claiming to have made this discovery for herself, but she didn't. She read it somewhere else. Different classes will have different guidelines for citing sources to avoid plagiarism. Here is some basic general advice that might help keep you out of trouble. To avoid idea plagiarism, tell us where you read or heard the idea. So, that student could fix the problem by writing it this way. As Jim Finkel at Reuters reports, it is now possible for a hacker to attack even mundane USB devices. Now it's more clear that the student isn't taking credit for the idea. The second kind of plagiarism we'll talk about here is language plagiarism. Language plagiarism occurs when a student uses somebody else's language to express an idea without signaling to the reader that he or she is using somebody else's language. Here's an example of language plagiarism. Notice that in this example, the student has copied a sentence from the original article word for word. Readers of the paper might think that the student wrote this sentence for himself, and we give him credit as if he did. But he didn't write it for himself, he copied it from somewhere else. Now, different classes might give you different guidelines for avoiding language plagiarism. But here is some basic, general advice for avoiding language plagiarism that could keep you out of trouble. To avoid language plagiarism, restate the idea in your own words. Here's an example of what that might look like. The sentence, USB devices such as keyboards, thumb drives, and mice can be used to hack into personal computers in a potential new class of attacks that evade all known security protections, could possibly become, it is now possible for a hacker to attack even mundane USB devices. By rewriting the sentence, we have avoided language plagiarism. But look, we still have the problem of idea plagiarism. The new version doesn't tell us whose ideas the student is using. Fortunately, we already know how to avoid idea plagiarism. To avoid idea plagiarism, tell us where you read or heard the idea. As it stands, we can't tell where the student read this idea. The student should add a phrase that attributes the idea to the source that he learned it from. So those are the two kinds of plagiarism that you should look out for, idea plagiarism and language plagiarism. The big idea here is that when you write a paper, we want to be able to distinguish what you are writing from what other people have already written. If you do some research for your papers, make sure that we can easily distinguish your ideas and your language from the ideas and the language that you encountered in your sources. Don't present other people's work as if it's your work. Your teacher will probably have more advice for you if you need help. Okay, that's all for now on Play Cybersecurity. In this lesson, I'll sketch a definition of cybersecurity for you, and I'll make the case that cybersecurity is something that everybody can benefit from studying. It's rewarding for both casual computer users and technology enthusiasts alike. 
So what is cybersecurity exactly? One rough definition looks like this. Cybersecurity is protecting yourself and others from attacks that are carried out primarily with computers. Now, because the overwhelming majority of computer-based attacks are attacks on information, we may use the term cybersecurity interchangeably with the term information security. Cybersecurity is a rewarding study because no computer is secure, including yours. Every computer and every system has security vulnerabilities, including Wi-Fi networks, the servers that host your email accounts, your bank, every retailer that swipes your payment cards, and any computers that you might be holding or wearing right now. Even if nobody knows what those vulnerabilities are yet, be assured they exist. Now, maybe at first that perspective makes it sound like cybersecurity isn't worth studying at all. Why worry about a problem that I can't fix, you might ask. The answer is that you can still be more or less secure, and the more secure you are, the less of a target you are. Cyber criminals who are out to steal passwords or credit card numbers or whatever else, they're usually going to target less secure machines and less secure systems. I mean, think about it. Imagine that you're a bicycle thief and you find two similar bikes sitting on a bike rack, one with a lock and one without a lock. Which one would you be more likely to steal? The lockless one, right? Criminals are practical like that. They attack weaknesses. All other things being equal, the more weaknesses you cover, the lower the probability of a security breach. Now, you might be thinking that all this talk of computer weaknesses doesn't apply to you. You might be thinking, but I use a Mac or a Linux machine. I thought Mac and Linux machines were secure. But that's not really the case. Mac and Linux machines are just less popular. Why does popularity matter? Well, think like a criminal again for a minute. Imagine that you are a bicycle thief, and imagine that everybody in your city has bought a new lock for their bike. Now imagine that 9 out of every 10 cyclists has purchased lock A, and 1 out of every 10 has purchased lock B. Which kind of lock would you learn to pick? Well, you'd learn to pick lock A, right? Because there's many, many more opportunities to pick that lock. Now imagine that it's computers instead of bicycles. It turns out that there are about nine Windows computers for every Mac out there, assuming for now that we aren't including tablets and smartphones. And even fewer people run Linux machines. So for now, it's easier and more profitable for cyber criminals to focus their attacks on Windows PCs. But if the market were to even out so that Windows PCs didn't dominate like they do now, we would begin to see more attacks against Mac and Linux users as well. There is nothing inherently more secure about a Mac or a Linux computer, it's just easier for cyber criminals to focus their attacks on one kind of system, and it's more economical for them to attack the majority. But really, all this talk of attacking computers themselves is somewhat misleading. In reality, cyber criminals don't attack your computer at all. They attack you. We tend to think of cyber criminals as computer geniuses who use their technical mastery to hack into our systems. But most cyber criminals are more like con artists who exploit user behaviors rather than exploiting computer systems themselves. In many cyber attacks, the brand or type of computer that you're using is completely irrelevant because the criminal isn't attacking the computer, the criminal is trying to exploit you, the user. Now, a few cyber criminals out there probably are geniuses. But the truth is that most cyber attacks are carried out by regular criminals who have simply looked up how to attack a computer user. They are simply just following a set of directions. When these attacks work, they work because many computer users are naive. They don't understand how cyber criminals think, and they don't understand what kinds of cyber crimes are common or possible, and they don't really understand how the attacks are carried out. If you go online, you can find some lists of do's and don'ts for smart computer usage. Do's and don'ts are okay, but they don't really help you to understand why your computer is under attack or how those attacks are carried out. But we think that if you have a deeper understanding of cybersecurity, you'll be better prepared to recognize and avoid cyber attacks. And we also think that if you have a deeper understanding that goes beyond just simple do's and don'ts, then you'll be better prepared to teach yourself about new security problems when they arise. For this reason, we're going to go beyond do's and don'ts in this course and introduce themes like how computers work, how the internet works, how cyber criminals think, and what security tools are available to you. In this class, instead of just giving you a list of behaviors to blindly follow, 
we're going to help you to understand the issues surrounding cybersecurity so that you can take a more active role in your own digital defense. Finally, you might wonder whether this is going to be any fun. Well, our answer is yes. We think cybersecurity is loads of fun. Cybersecurity can feel like a great big strategy game, a game where everybody is a player, including computer users, security professionals, hackers, virus writers, con artists, corporations, banks, mobsters, armies, and nation states, all playing different roles and interacting with each other on different levels. Maybe it's the greatest, most complex strategy game in all of human history, and like it or not, you and your data are already in the game somehow. Okay, I hope that you're beginning to agree that cybersecurity... This is lesson three, cybersecurity terminology. In this lesson, I'm going to identify a few vocabulary terms that we use in cybersecurity, and I'm going to tell you a few stories that use those terms. We find that the best way to learn new words is to use them and to listen to other people using them. So that's what we're going to do here. Some of you may be watching this video as part of a course that uses this textbook. If you are, you should know that the vocabulary we're going to discuss in this video can all be found in chapter 1 of this book. Check out pages 6 through 11 especially. If you're not using this textbook, don't worry about it. Just follow along with the lesson. Here's a list of the vocabulary words that we're going to cover. Don't be intimidated here. We aren't asking you to memorize all of this just by watching this video. We find that the best way to learn new vocabulary is to encounter the words over and over again. Right now, we're just trying to provide some initial exposure to these words. Now, the first story I'm going to tell you is true. It's about a journalist named Matt Honan who was hacked by an anonymous cybercriminal. You can read about it in more depth at Wired.com. The story there is titled, How Apple and Amazon Security Flaws Led to My Epic Hacking. And this isn't a typo, by the way, he spells Matt with one T. Okay, I'm going to tell the story now. You should just follow along. Pay attention to the vocabulary words. As they come up, I'll highlight them for you. In August of 2012, hackers erased all of the data on Matt Honan's iPhone, iPad, and MacBook. Among the data lost were Honan's daughter's baby pictures and Honan's digital copies of old family photographs. The hackers also accessed Honan's Twitter account and tweeted a number of inflammatory, homophobic, and racist messages. They also deleted Honan's Google account, including eight years' worth of messages from his Gmail inbox. This attack compromised Honan's information on all three levels of the CIA model of information security. The hackers compromised the confidentiality of Honan's information when they accessed and viewed Honan's private, password-protected digital accounts. They compromised the integrity of Honan's information when they made unauthorized changes to it. These unauthorized changes included deleting his files and, in the case of his Twitter account, posting illegitimate messages. And of course, they compromised the availability of Honan's information. When the hackers changed Honan's passwords, he was locked out of his accounts, rendering his data temporarily unavailable. Even worse, when the hackers deleted Honan's data, they made it permanently unavailable. Or at least they attempted to do so. In the article on Wired.com, Honan expresses optimism that some of his information is recoverable. So, how did these hackers carry out this attack, which was both personally devastating and ultimately childish? Some of you may find this surprising, but these attacks were carried out without writing a single line of attack code. They required no special computer programs, nor did they require any particularly impressive technical skills. A script kitty, that is a hacker with no significant programming knowledge, could have easily pulled off these attacks because the only tools necessary were a web browser, a telephone, and personal information about Honan that was available to anybody with an internet connection. If you want more details, you'll have to read the whole story on Wired.com, but I'll give you a summary of how the attack went down. Here it goes. The hackers began by collecting all of the personal information about Honan that they could collect from Honan's social media accounts and public records that were available online. They got Honan's email address, physical address, and other bits of information, and they used that information to crack Honan's Amazon account. How did they crack his Amazon account, you might ask? Well, it was surprisingly simple. The hackers called Amazon, pretended to be Honan, and asked the Amazon representatives to reset Honan's account for them. 
The hackers used Honan's personal information, along with the clever use of a fake credit card number, to convince Amazon's customer service that the hackers were really Matt Honan. With access to Honan's Amazon account, the hackers were able to collect even more personal information about him. Most significantly, Amazon gave them the last four digits of Honan's credit card number. They used this information to crack Honan's Apple ID, which gave them access to Honan's Apple devices. How did they crack his Apple ID, you might ask? They used the same basic trick as before. They called customer service at Apple and used Honan's personal information to convince them to reset his Apple ID password for them. Once they had access to his Apple ID, they had enough information and enough access to his accounts that they could run a password reset on his Google account. So they reset his Google password and logged into his Google account. They used his Google account to collect the information they needed to log into his Twitter account. And finally, they used his Twitter account to post offensive and embarrassing messages. To cover their tracks, the hackers deleted Honan's Google account and they used his Apple ID to request a remote data wipe of his MacBook, iPhone, and iPad data. Ironically, this remote wipe service from Apple is intended to protect users from cyber criminals. It allows a user to remotely request that their data be deleted in the event that one's laptop, tablet, or phone are stolen. The hackers in this story took advantage of several security vulnerabilities. While some of these vulnerabilities were beyond Honan's control, one of the primary vulnerabilities was Honan's own fault. He had linked several of his online accounts together in such a way that access to one account could grant a hacker access to all of them. Honan admits that the attack would not have worked if he had taken care of the vulnerabilities that were under his control. Honan wrote an article about his experience for Wired.com. In the course of writing the article, he was able to make anonymous contact with one of the perpetrators, who explained the method that they had used to attack Honan's accounts. In cybersecurity terms, this method of attack is called an exploit. Once Honan knew this exploit, he and his peers at Wired.com tested to see if they could recreate the attacks in a controlled setting. They were successful several times, and if they had wanted to, they could have mounted malicious attacks of their own. Since then, Amazon and Apple have insisted that they have updated their customer identification protocols to eliminate the vulnerabilities on their end of the problem. So we can hope that these exploits are no longer effective. In his write-up of the story, Honan points out that as bad as the hack was, its impact could have been much worse. Had these hackers been cyber criminals who were driven by profit, they could, they could have easily used his email accounts to access his online banking information and ruin his finances. In a way, Honan was fortunate. If Honan's attacker wasn't driven by profit, what did drive him or her? Well, the hacker Honan exchanged messages with claimed that he was a hacker activist, a hacktivist, and that his motivation was to spread awareness about computer security. He also claimed that he had help from another hacker, and he claimed that his helper was the one who was responsible for deleting Honan's data and his Google account. What do you think? This particular hacker claimed that he is really one of the good guys. Is he? Did he perform a valuable public service by hacking Honan's accounts? Okay, now that we have an idea of how that attack went down, let's perform a little informal risk assessment. As you may have already read in the textbook, in the language of cybersecurity, risk is the combined measure of all the vulnerabilities, threats, and potential impact of cyber attacks for a given system. But what do these words mean exactly? If you already read the textbook, you might remember that vulnerability is a security term for describing potential weak points in a security system. Threat is a security term for describing the likelihood of a given attack. Impact is a security term for describing the consequences of an attack. And as I said, risk is the combined measure of vulnerability, threat, and impact. So let's pretend for a moment that you use the same gadgets and accounts that Honan uses, and let's pretend that Apple and Amazon have not yet fixed the vulnerabilities on their end of the problem. If that were the case, how could you lower your security risks? Well, one way would be to reduce your vulnerability to attack. Honan points out that he would have decreased his vulnerability if he had enabled two-factor authentication on his Google account. Those of you who've used Gmail might be familiar with two-factor authentication. 
every Google account is protected by at least one factor of authentication, a password. With Google, users have the option to require a second factor, a unique single-use code which is sent to your phone. Two-factor authentication dramatically reduces vulnerability. It's much tougher for a hacker to get your password and access your phone than it is for him to just get your password alone. Another way to reduce risk would be to reduce threat, or the likelihood, of an attack. Honan's threat of attack was naturally higher than yours probably is. He's a public figure who is known for writing online magazine articles about cybersecurity. These factors made him an enticing target for hackers. A relatively anonymous internet user like you or me is probably less likely to be targeted by hackers, at least by hackers who are interested in glory. As a rule of thumb, consider this. The more that people stand to gain from attacking you, the more likely you are to be attacked. This means that high reward targets faced increased threat, which translates into increased risk. Finally, we might reduce risk by reducing the potential impact of an attack. For example, Honan's attack would have been much lower impact if he had backed up his daughter's baby pictures on disks or on an external hard drive, or on some other data storage device. If he had backups, he could have recovered more easily from his epic hacking experience. Well, good. I see that I was able to use most of the vocabulary words from pages 6 through 11 of the textbook in that epic hacking story. The only terms that I seem to have left out are nation-state, zero-day exploit, and malicious insider. I'll tell you another story, and I'll make sure to use those three terms in that story. I'll make this one shorter, though. The following story, a story about a cyber attack that was probably carried out by a nation-state, is based on a profile that ran on CBS's 60 Minutes in 2012. The story goes like this. In June of 2010, a small security company in Belarus discovered a computer virus programmed to attack Siemens brand industrial control systems. An industrial control system is a computer that controls big industrial systems, such as a factory floor or a citywide electrical network. Industrial control systems are relatively small in size, but they do a lot of work. They direct most of the equipment in large facilities. Most factories, power plants, and other such facilities that you know of probably use some kind of industrial control system. This particular virus became known as Stuxnet. As security professionals analyzed Stuxnet, they made a surprising discovery. Though Stuxnet would infect many Siemens brand industrial control systems, it would only attack one of them. That's not to say that it would only attack one kind of Siemens system, mind you, but it would literally only attack one particular computer in the entire world. The only computer in the world that Stuxnet, Stuxnet was programmed to attack was the industrial control system at a particular uranium enrichment facility in Iran. Stuxnet infected many systems, but it would only attack this particular facility. The remarkably specific nature of Stuxnet, combined with its jaw-droppingly complex attack code, has led many pundits to speculate that no ordinary hacker is responsible for Stuxnet. Many people have reasoned that it must have been developed by a nation-state, most likely the United States or Israel, but maybe both. Of course, no government is taking responsibility for Stuxnet, and if it is indeed a government operation, then all records of it are top secret. What does Stuxnet do? Security professionals have determined that when Stuxnet found the right computer, it was programmed to make the computer accelerate the rate of rotation for some motorized centrifuges. That's equipment necessary for the enrichment of uranium. Stuxnet would also make the computer display incorrect data on the centrifuges so that the plant operators wouldn't see that anything was wrong. The overacceleration would damage the centrifuges, but the plant operators would attribute the damage to bad materials rather than to overacceleration. In order to write such specialized attack code, the Stuxnet programmers required intimate knowledge of the Iranian plant. A security expert interviewed in the 60 Minutes report claimed that the authors of Stuxnet probably knew the power plant better than the Iranian operators themselves. 
For this reason, some have speculated that a malicious insider may have leaked information about the plant to the programmers of Stuxnet. Did Stuxnet work? Nobody knows for sure, but it had a good chance because it was a zero-day exploit. That is, the attackers found the vulnerability before anybody else knew about it. Also, the plant that it was designed to attack did replace somewhere between 1 and 2,000 centrifuges. So, based on this circumstantial evidence, many security officials have concluded that Stuxnet probably caused the damage that it was designed to cause. That's all of the stories that I have for you for now. I hope that they have helped to familiarize you with some of those new security terms. If you have any trouble with learning the vocabulary in this class, the best advice I can give you is to just be patient. As long as you keep reading things that use this language, and as long as you look up the words that you don't understand, you will pick them up eventually. You just have to use them to learn them. In the next video, we're going to begin exploring the inner workings of a computer system. Now, let's define computers, part one of two. As I'm sure you all know, technological advances have compressed more and more computing power into smaller and smaller packages. The desktop computers of yesterday are easily exceeded by the computing power of an average phone. Computers have become so compact and so seamless in appearance that it's becoming easier and easier to forget that they are complex systems composed of a variety of interacting parts. In this lesson, we're going to take apart a computer and examine how some of the bigger parts interact with each other. We're also going to begin examining how software interacts with computers. The goal isn't to make you an expert. I just hope to demystify computers for you a bit so that you're more comfortable talking about computer problems and better prepared to consider different ways to solve these problems. We might imagine four layers in a computer system. The user, the hardware, the operating system, and the applications. I'll discuss all four of these layers and describe how they interact. Layer one is the user, and that's easy enough to describe. The user is you. Well, you and anybody else who wants to accomplish some task with a computer. When you connect a computer to the internet, you connect to other computers, but you also potentially connect to countless other computer users. Most of these users are people who you want to connect with, friends, journalists, bankers, retailers, etc. But a few of them are cyber criminals of some kind, so keep that in mind. Layer two of the computer system is the hardware of the computer, its physical parts. We'll spend the bulk of this lecture describing hardware. We'll begin demystifying hardware by examining what we can see from the outside of the computer. Then we'll break open the computer and poke around at the hardware on the inside. To begin, let's consider a desktop system. We can see several different parts already. A monitor, a keyboard, a mouse, and a computer case, also known as a tower. Perhaps a printer is also lurking around somewhere nearby. The monitor, keyboard, mouse, and printer all need to communicate with the computer inside the tower, so they will usually be connected to the computer via cables. In some cases, these devices are able to connect wirelessly, either via Bluetooth connections or, especially in the case of printers, via a wireless internet router. But for the sake of keeping things obvious, we'll assume for now that these devices are networked together with cables. The devices that draw the most electricity, so the computer inside the tower, the monitor, and the printer, will all need a power cable. We didn't include power cables in this illustration, but you can imagine where they would go. Smaller devices, like the keyboard and the mouse, normally don't require a direct connection to a power outlet. The universal serial bus, or USB, connections that connect the keyboard and mouse to the computer are built to carry both data and electrical power, and so lower, low power devices like keyboards and mice normally route electricity from the computer tower. They just borrow power from the computer itself. In the case of wireless keyboards and wireless mice, they will be powered by batteries, of course. Now, the primary function of a monitor and a printer is to display information. We can think of information flowing from the computer into the monitor and printer, which display it for the user. Have you ever thought of a printer as a very slow, paper-based computer monitor? In some sense, that's what a printer is. The primary function of a keyboard and mouse is to input information and input commands into the computer. We can think of the information starting with the user and flowing into the computer via the keyboard and the mouse. 
most desktop computers will also be connected to the internet. For now, let's assume that they use a physical ethernet cable rather than a wireless connection. Through this ethernet cable, the computer can communicate with the internet, sharing potentially huge amounts of information with the outside world. So this is what the whole system looks like from the outside. Electricity flows from a power outlet into the tower, and from the tower, some of the electricity is allocated to the keyboard and the mouse. Electricity also flows from an outlet to the monitor and from an outlet to the printer. The computer sends information from the tower to the monitor or printer, which allows the user to see it. The user inputs information and commands into the computer via the keyboard and the mouse. Finally, the computer is able to trade information with other computers via its internet connection. Now let's open up the tower and see what's inside that. We should find a large greenish plate fixed to one side of the tower. This plate is called a motherboard, and all the hardware inside the computer is connected together through this motherboard. We should also see a small fan fixed to the motherboard. This fan marks the presence of the central processing unit, or CPU, of the computer. This CPU processes information and executes a multitude of various instructions that the CPU receives from the software programs that are running on the computer. The overwhelming majority of actual computing that the computer does takes place here at the CPU. One helpful analogy is to think of the CPU as the brain that does the thinking in the computer. Though the CPU performs an astonishing number of computations in the blink of an eye, the CPU is a small device. It's just a small silicon chip. It's a lot smaller than the fan apparatus that covers it, and that's all you can see here in this picture. The fan helps to cool the CPU, maintaining it at an operable temperature. Near the CPU, we find small cards of random access memory, or RAM. RAM is the working memory inside a computer. If the CPU is doing all of the thinking, then the RAM provides content for the CPU to think about. Sometimes people will refer to RAM simply as memory. In computer language, the terms RAM and memory are informally interchangeable. If somebody asks how much memory is installed on a computer, they're probably referring to its RAM. And in these videos, I'm probably going to use the terms memory and RAM interchangeably. Near the front of the computer tower, where users normally insert disks and where the power button is normally located, we find two storage units in this, in this computer, the hard drive and the CD slash DVD drive. The hard drive contains a series of magnetic disks, together referred to as the hard disk, which can store a large amount of information. The hard disk can usually store tens or hundreds of times more information than can be held in the computer's RAM. For most computers, the hard disk is its primary storage unit containing both data files uh, such as user documents, music, and photos, and program files, so files that tell the CPU how to run different programs. But users don't have to store data in the computer's hard drive. Users can also store files and programs on removable media such as CDs and DVDs. Files stored on CDs and DVDs are accessible via a computer's CD slash DVD drive. The advantage to keeping files and programs on removable disks is that they become easier to transport and they are also safe if the computer or hard drive happens to fail completely. The advantage to keeping files and programs on the computer's hard drive are that they should always be accessible whenever you have access to your computer and that they should load much faster from the hard drive than they would have from a CD or a DVD. Now, these days people don't use CDs and DVDs nearly as much as they did, say, 10 years ago but you still might see a CD slash DVD drive on a desktop computer. Sometimes people confuse a computer's memory with its storage, but we will be using those terms in different senses here. Memory, like I said, is the RAM. It's the information that the CPU has immediately available to it. Storage, on the other hand, is all of the information that the CPU has access to through drives like the hard drive or the CD slash DVD drive. There are other types of storage drives too, like say, flash drives. A CPU might have access to information that's in storage, but for the CPU to perform rapid and efficient operations with that information, the CPU must first load that stored information into its memory. To help illustrate the difference between computer memory and computer storage, 
I'm going to ask you to perform a little thought experiment. To start, close your eyes and picture your very first school teacher. Can you remember what he or she looks like? If you can't remember your first teacher, picture the earliest teacher that you can remember. Do you have somebody in mind? Not good. Open your eyes if you haven't already opened them up. Now, consider this. How long has it been since you thought about that person? Probably quite a long time, maybe even years. In any case, I bet you weren't thinking about him or her right before I asked you to. When the memory of that person was sitting dormant in your brain, that was kind of like computer storage, like you'd find on a hard drive. It's in there somewhere, but you aren't doing much with that information. It's just sitting there. When you recalled that memory to your mind, that was kind of like computer RAM. You accessed some information from storage, and you began operating with it, so you were conscious of it. The last piece of hardware I'm going to discuss in this lecture are input and output cards. A motherboard will normally contain a number of expansion slots for various input and output cards. For example, this motherboard has a slot for an Ethernet card, and in fact, there is an Ethernet card plugged into that slot. The Ethernet card has a port for an Ethernet cable, and this port will be exposed at the back of the computer tower so that the user can easily plug an Ethernet cable into the computer. The computer connects to the internet through this ethernet card, and as you can imagine, the internet allows for both inputting information into the computer and outputting information from the computer. This computer also has a number of other slots for input and output cards, but in this image, those slots are empty. Other common expansion cards include graphics cards and sound cards. Graphics and sound cards will have some sort of audio or video ports, which will be exposed at the back of the computer for user access. Upgrading the graphics and sound cards can improve a computer's audiovisual outputs, and so such upgrades are popular among gamers and artists. Now, so far, we've been looking at the hardware on a desktop PC. I should point out that most notebooks, tablets, and smartphones have many of the same basic parts as a desktop. The main difference for these smaller devices is that the parts have been compressed and reconfigured to take up as little space as possible. A notebook computer is basically a desktop computer where the monitor, keyboard, and computer tower are all compressed into a package that's about the size of a notebook. Because a mouse doesn't really fit into a notebook, laptop manufacturers have replaced the mouse with onboard touchpad pointing devices. Tablets and smartphones come in even smaller packages and they replace both the keyboard and the mouse with a touchscreen display. Tablets and smartphones also replace those boxy data storage devices from a desktop, like the hard drive and the CD and DVD drives, with internal flash-based storage. So that's the hardware of a computer. Now let's move on to the third layer of this computer system, the computer's operating system. The operating system is a large, complex program that runs on your computer. Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and Android are examples of well-known operating systems. If you have a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone, it probably runs one of those four. An operating system coordinates and facilitates the interactions between users, hardware, and software applications. Operating systems display the files that are available to the user. When the user commands the operating system to run a program or to open a data file, the operating system is responsible for accessing the appropriate file and coordinating, the, its, coordinating its interactions with the computer's hardware. Pretty much every interaction that you have with the computer is mediated through the computer's operating system. The fourth and final layer that we're going to discuss in this lecture is the layer of computer applications. Applications are programs that are designed to perform specific tasks for the user. For example, most operating systems come with a calculator application that's pre-installed. Your web browser, such as Firefox, Chrome, or Safari, is another example of an application. The operating system displays which applications, which applications are available to the user, and when the user selects an application, the operating system opens the application and coordinates its interactions with the computer's hardware. Applications are normally stored on the hard disk of a computer, though it's possible to store them in other places as well, perhaps on a CD or DVD, or on a thumb drive. Okay, in this lesson, I introduced you to four layers in a computer system. The users, the hardware, the operating system, and the applications. 
That will be all for now on Demystifying Computers. In part 2 of this lesson, we will continue to demystify of 2. In the last lecture, I tried to demystify computers a little bit by identifying and examining four layers in a computer system. The user, the hardware, the operating system, and the applications. In this lecture, I hope to illustrate and to clarify how these layers interact with each other by examining what happens when you turn a computer on and what happens when you run an application. In this lesson, I'm going to walk you through a couple of illustrations out of this textbook, which some of you may be using in a class that assigns these videos. But don't worry if you aren't using the textbook, just follow along with the video. We'll start with this illustration, which diagrams what happens when we turn on a computer. When we press the power button on a computer, the computer's power supply begins to distribute current to the different parts of the computer so that they can operate. When the CPU receives current from the power supply, the CPU searches for a special program that helps to load the operating system into the computer. For PCs, this program is called the Basic Input-Output System, or BIOS. As you can see, in this diagram, it's labeled BIOS. Now, as you may remember from the last lesson, most of the program files on your computer are stored on a hard disk. However, the BIOS is a special program hardwired into the motherboard itself. What does it do? Well, the BIOS grants the CPU access to all of the hardware components that are connected to the motherboard, and it helps the CPU to access the computer's startup code, which is called boot code. Most computers store boot code in the hard disk, but it's also possible to configure a computer to boot from another storage device, such as a CD or a USB flash drive. The boot code is loaded from the computer storage into its RAM, and the CPU runs the boot code from the RAM. The boot code tells the computer to load the operating system into the computer's memory, and so the computer loads the operating system. Like the boot code, the operating system is normally stored on a computer's hard drive, but it's possible to store an operating system on some other storage device, such as a CD or a USB device. Wherever the operating system is, the computer will load it into RAM so that the CPU can run it. Once the operating system is loaded, it will automatically tell the CPU to run a number of automatic startup applications, such as device drivers, firewalls, antivirus software, the computer's clock and calendar, and other applications that run in the background on the computer. Much like the boot code and the operating system, these automatic startup applications are stored on a storage device, and they must be loaded into RAM before the CPU can run them. Once those automatic startup applications are up and running, the user may begin to interact with the computer via the mouse and keyboard. If you have a username and password set up on your computer, this is the point where you'd be prompted to enter it. So that's what happens when you switch on a computer. Now let's take a look at what happens when you load and run an application. For this, let's look at a different illustration. This illustration shows what happens when you load an application onto your computer. I already said that the operating system will run a number of applications automatically, but many applications are configured to only run when the user commands the operating system to run that application. For example, your computer usually won't run a web browser unless you tell the computer to open the web browser. This curvy red arrow represents a user entering the command to run a program, say by double-clicking on the program with the computer's mouse. This command is processed by the operating system, which is running on the computer's memory. The operating system then accesses the program file from a storage device. Let's imagine that the program that the user wanted to open is a web browser. The web browser file loads into the computer's memory and the web browser runs from there. The web browser will normally display something for the user to see on the computer monitor and the user can usually input information and commands into the application through the keyboard and the mouse. For example, users can navigate to web pages by typing a web address into the browser's address bar and they might interact with web pages by clicking on different parts of the page with the mouse pointer. And here's something more that you should know. As we have seen, applications run through your computer's operating system. That means that anytime you're running an application, it can potentially access anything that the operating system can access. Because the operating system has access to every file and every piece of hardware connected to your computer, every application on your computer may also potentially access any file or any piece of hardware on your computer. 
So in principle, an active application can access everything in your computer system, even if the user isn't aware of it. This means that it's possible to write applications that use your own computer against you. For example, it would be possible to write an application that records all of the keystrokes that a user punches into their keyboard, and then secretly uses an internet connection to send that keystroke information to some third party. And then that third party could mine your keystrokes for sensitive information, like usernames and passwords or bank account numbers. In fact, many such applications already exist. They are called key logging programs, and cybercriminals would be delighted to install one on your computer. Okay, that's all for now on these two illustrations. Obviously, there is much more to learn. I just wanted to give you an overview so that you could get an idea of how your computer system is tied together. Understanding how the different parts of the system are connected together should eventually help you to understand what kinds of weaknesses the bad guys like to attack. In the next video, we're going to continue laying the groundwork for basic understanding of computer science. And remember, we're doing this so that you'll be better prepared to understand how cybercriminals use the wonders of computing against you. These past couple lessons, we've been discussing individual computers, but now we're going to move on to a vast network of computers that are all connected together, and that is
lesson, I introduced passwords, and I explained how businesses use encryption formulas called hash functions to help keep your passwords a secret. It would be nice if that were the final word on the matter. That is, if hash functions would ensure that passwords would remain secure always and forever. But of course, that's not the world we live in. In the real world, our passwords remain vulnerable. In this lecture, I'll introduce you to 10 common threats to your passwords. User disclosure, social engineering, phishing, key logging, wireless sniffing, brute force guessing, dictionary attacks, unencrypted password files, exposed passwords with known hash values, and security questions. Throughout this video, I'll suggest ways in which you can minimize these threats. As you will see, it's important to have a strong password, but it's even more important to handle your password wisely. Password threat one is user disclosure. Now this might seem obvious, but you shouldn't tell other people your passwords. You can never tell for certain who is and who is not trustworthy. You might respond, oh, I trust this person. I know that she's not a cyber criminal. And there's a good chance that you're right. However, are you sure that you trust all of the people that this other person trusts? What if she discloses your password to a criminal somehow? And even if you don't believe that this trusted person would intentionally disclose your password, are you really sure that she wouldn't do so accidentally? If you let your mind wander for a moment, it's easy to think of dozens of scenarios in which a trusted person could accidentally lose or disclose your private password. The bottom line is that as soon as you share your password, you lose control over how that password is shared by others. Why take such an unnecessary risk? Just keep them to yourself. You should especially avoid emailing or messaging your password to other people. Even if you trust the recipient with your life, you can't guarantee that somebody else isn't reading their emails or won't read them sometime in the future. You should also avoid writing your password down in obvious places. If you do have to write a password down, don't keep it near your computer. And for goodness sake, don't keep a list of passwords on your computer under the file name passwords. Avoid keeping your passwords on a computer file altogether unless you're using a trusted password management software. If you keep a handwritten list of passwords, keep that list somewhere secret and safe. Remember, no matter how strong your password is, its strength does you no good if you simply disclose it to the bad guys. Password threat number two is social engineering. Sometimes, as we've just seen, users might disclose their passwords simply by being careless. Other times, however, cyber criminals work behind the scenes to create social situations that encourage users to disclose their passwords. This is called social engineering. A cyber criminal is unlikely to simply call you up on the phone and shout, Hey, you, give me your passwords. They will be more sneaky than that. They might call you on the phone and say that they're an IT professional from your school or your work. And under this disguise, they might ask you for your password. Don't fall for such schemes. And this telephone trick is only one example of social engineering. There are many, many kinds of social engineering out there. And we'll discuss social engineering a little more in later videos in this course. Password threat number three is phishing. Phishing is one kind of social engineering. It might be the most common kind. In phishing scams, a cyber criminal sends out bait, often in the form of an email. And that bait encourages unwitting users to voluntarily disclose their passwords. Here's an example of a real phishing email that I received in my university email inbox. Dear Chase customer, it says, your online account will expire today on Thursday, February 13th, 2014. To keep your account updated, please click log on to Chase Online and proceed with the verification process. Copyright 2014, J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. There are a lot of red flags in this email, but the most significant one is that I do not bank at Chase, so this is clearly a fraud. What do you think would happen if I clicked on that link? Now, I didn't click on it because it's not safe to click on fraudulent links like this, but if I had clicked on it, I'm sure I would have been confronted with some fake so-called verification forms, and I'm sure those forms would have asked me to enter my login information for Chase. 
if I did have a Chase account, and if I had entered my login information into those fraudulent forms, I'm sure that I would have been giving my banking information over to a cyber criminal. No bank or other legitimate institution will send you an urgent email insisting that you log into their website. In fact, you should avoid entering login information into any website that you have arrived at by clicking on a link in an email. If you receive suspicious or apparently urgent emails or even text messages from your bank or from any other institution that you do business with, you can always look up their phone number and call them on the phone and then ask them about it. In all likelihood, they'll inform you that the message you received was a scam and they'll recommend that you delete it. They may even ask you to provide more information about the scam so that they can prepare to defend their other customers against it. It's worth pointing out that strong passwords won't protect you from social engineering scams such as phishing scams. Only your wits and your wisdom will protect you from such scams. Password threat number four is key logging. Another way that cyber criminals discover passwords is through the use of key logging hardware or key logging software. Let's look at key logging hardware first. A key logger keeps track of every keystroke made on a particular keyboard or on a particular computer. Key logging hardware consists of small, discrete devices that plug into a computer's USB drive. These devices themselves contain a USB port, which the keyboard cable plugs into. Key logging devices blend in well with the cables and plugs and ports on the back of a computer, and they're difficult to spot if you aren't looking for them. Although key loggers are small, they can store months worth of keystroke records. So a cyber criminal could quickly install a key logger into a public computer, say at a library, and then they could return for the keystroke records weeks or months later. But not all key loggers require extra hardware devices. There is such a thing as key logging software as well, and it's completely invisible from the outside of the computer. Key logging software is a computer application that keeps track of your keystrokes. The keylogger might save those keystroke records on the computer to be extracted later, or it could even message the data to a third party somewhere else in the world through the internet. Because keylogging hardware is easy to install on public computers, it's good practice to avoid logging into private accounts on public computers. But for your own private devices, keylogging software is probably the greater threat. You can avoid keylogging software by only visiting websites that you trust so as to avoid unintentionally downloading the keylogging software. Of course, you should also only install software on your computer if you know and trust the source of that software. And remember, even if you're careful with your computer, your friends may not be careful with theirs. It's very difficult for a user to know whether their friends' computers have keylogging software on them. So it's a good idea to avoid logging into private accounts on a friend's computer. As a rule of thumb, security risks are usually greater on computers that you don't control. So can a strong password protect you from keylogging devices and keylogging software? Unfortunately, no. The best protections from keyloggers are informed use of your own computer and caution when using computers that are controlled by other people. Password threat number five is wireless sniffing. Have you ever seen a movie where somebody's having a private telephone conversation on a landline telephone, and then somebody else picks up a different phone somewhere else in the house and eavesdrops on that conversation? Well, wireless sniffing is a similar kind of eavesdropping that can happen on public wireless internet connections. Say you're in a coffee shop surfing the web. A cybercriminal within range of that wireless network can use a variety of methods to intercept the signals sent back and forth between your computer and the wireless router. So they can intercept the information that's sent from the wireless router to your computer, and they can also intercept the information that your computer sends to a wireless router. Can a strong password protect you from wireless sniffing? Again, no, it can't. The way to protect yourself from wireless sniffing will be to understand how wireless networks work, to understand the weaknesses that cybercriminals attack, and to understand how you can avoid those weaknesses. And we're going to discuss those things in more detail in other lessons. Password threat number six is brute force guessing. One way that cybercriminals discover passwords is by just guessing them. 
In a brute force attack, a cyber criminal uses a computer to try to guess every possible password for your account until she just happens to guess the right one. Can a strong password protect you from brute force guessing? Yes, it can. Short passwords take much less time to crack by these methods than long, strong passwords do. Every character that you add to your password makes your password exponentially more difficult to randomly guess. Furthermore, adding more kinds of characters will also make your password more difficult to guess. A long password consisting of lowercase letters is difficult to randomly guess, but a long password consisting of both lowercase and capital letters is much, much more difficult to randomly guess. Adding more keyboard symbols like numbers and punctuation marks adds even more possibilities for the brute force attacker to deal with. Websites will also help to protect you from brute force attackers by requiring users to complete a completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart, or a CAPTCHA as it's commonly abbreviated. A CAPTCHA presents symbols on the screen that are difficult for computers to interpret, but easy for humans. If the user can't interpret the CAPTCHA, then the website denies their login request. This way, even if a computerized attack does guess your password, the CAPTCHA helps to prevent the computer from automatically logging in to your account. Password threat number seven is dictionary attacks. Because there are practically innumerable possible passwords and cybercriminals don't have infinite time to spend trying to crack them, brute force guessing is often pretty impractical. However, in reality, users don't usually choose literally random strings of characters as their passwords because literally random strings of characters are difficult to remember. Users follow patterns when they create passwords, and many of them tend to follow the same patterns. Cybercriminals keep lists of popular passwords and popular password patterns, and they'll limit their password guessing to these lists. Such focused attacks are called dictionary attacks. Some dictionary attack lists will contain millions of potential passwords. That's a lot of passwords, and it's more than a person could work through on their own. But with the help of a computer, a cybercriminal can potentially work through such a list relatively quickly. Therefore, dictionary attacks are much more practical than brute force guessing attacks. Dictionary attacks usually target common passwords, like the word password, 12345, the home row keys A, S, D, F, J, K, L, semicolon, or the phrase let me in. they might also target public information about a user. For example, sometimes people will incorporate their own name, address, or phone number into their password. Cybercriminals know this, and so they'll sometimes add publicly available knowledge about a user into their dictionary attacks. Publicly available knowledge includes things like your name and telephone number, which might be available in a telephone directory. It also includes whatever information the public can see about you, on your social networking sites like Facebook or Twitter. If you tweet about your cat, then a cyber criminal might decide to incorporate your cat's name into a dictionary attack. Can a strong password protect you from dictionary attacks? Yes, it can. A strong password avoids common keywords and patterns that cyber criminals exploit in dictionary attacks. Password threat number eight is password files that aren't encrypted. In a previous lesson, I discussed the encryption of password files. In order to keep lists of user passwords safe, companies will normally encrypt them using an irreversible algorithm called a hash function. However, it turns out that not all companies hashed their passwords. In 2009, hackers broke into a social media service called RockU and stole their password files. The passwords had not been encrypted, so the hackers obtained a list that displayed 32 million usernames and passwords in just plain, old, ordinary, unencrypted text. Now, there isn't much that you can do to protect yourself from such an attack. You just don't have very much control over whether or not a company encrypts your passwords. But the RockU attack has some instructive potential for us. The password list at RockU went public 
and so we can use that list to determine some common user chosen passwords. Since the bad guys have this list too, we know to avoid common passwords such as those at the very top of the RockU list. It's worth noticing that the top three passwords at RockU were 123456, 12345, and 12345678. A strong password won't protect your password from being stolen off of a company server. However, these attacks at least help us to understand which passwords we should avoid in the first place. Password security threat number nine is exposed passwords with known hash values. Sometimes, cybercriminals will steal a list of encrypted password files even though they don't have the means to break the encryption. So how is this useful to them? Well, it turns out that cybercriminals can often get access to the same algorithms that the good guys use to encrypt passwords. So there really isn't anything to stop a cybercriminal from taking a known password, running it through the algorithm, and seeing what value it spits out. Here, we can see that the word password gets converted into a long string of numbers and letters starting with 5F4. It's possible, and relatively easy, for cybercriminals to obtain long lists of common passwords and then to determine the hash values for all of them. Now, if a cybercriminal steals a company's list of encrypted passwords, they can search the encrypted passwords for hash values that match the list that they've made themselves. In this example, the username Gadget has an encrypted password that matches the encrypted value that was obtained by encrypting the word password. So that means that Gadget's password must also be the word password. So if hackers steal a list of encrypted passwords from a company that you do business with, they can sometimes figure out your password. They'll compare the stolen encrypted passwords to passwords that they have encrypted for themselves. However, a strong password will help to protect you from this kind of attack. The stronger your password is, the less likely it is to appear on a list of passwords that cybercriminals have encrypted for themselves. Password threat number 10 is security questions. What happens if you forget your own password? Many online businesses offer a password retrieval service so that losing your password doesn't necessarily mean that you'll lose your account altogether. Many password retrieval systems rely on security questions. To retrieve your password, you must answer a supposedly secret question correctly. If you get the question right, the service will email you your password or perhaps email you a link to a password reset service. The problem with this system is that security questions are often much easier to guess than the passwords themselves. Common security questions are, what is your mother's maiden name? Who was your childhood best friend? And what is your favorite pet's name? Sometimes it's really, really easy to obtain the answers to those questions. The answers might be posted on somebody's Facebook page, or maybe they'll be revealed in a tweet or an Instagram photo. So how should you deal with security questions? One good practice is to simply lie. Another method is to tell the truth, but to add a random string of characters at the end of your true response. This random string amounts to a secondary password. Even if a hacker knows the answer to your security question, she'll have a hard time guessing this secondary password. Most companies' password retrieval systems will lock out the user after a few failed attempts to answer the security question. Whether you choose to lie or to use the truth plus a secondary password, the hacker is unlikely to guess your security response in just a few guesses. They'll probably get locked out. Whichever solution you choose, one difficulty will remain. How should you go about remembering your response to the security question? If you can forget your password, then surely you can forget your response to the security question too, especially if it's a lie or involves a second password. In a future lecture, I'll share some recommendations for password management. Many of these recommendations will apply equally well to security questions as they do to passwords. Okay, so let's review. In this lesson, we touched on 10 common password threats. User disclosure, 
social engineering, phishing, key logging, wireless sniffing, brute force guessing, dictionary attacks, password files that are not encrypted, exposed
send, store, and receive emails. Some of you may be watching these videos for a course that uses this textbook. The illustrations that we're going to look at in this video are both from chapter 4. Now if you aren't using this textbook, don't worry about it, just follow along with the video. To begin, let's examine an illustration that summarizes the basic parts of an email system. For now, let's pretend that an email message is moving from left to right. The sender is the user on the left, and the recipient is the user on the right. To help us to talk about these users, let's give them names. I'll call the user on the left Jack, and the one on the right Jill. Jack will begin by writing and addressing the email using what is called a user agent. In Jack's case, his user agent is an email application that lives on his own computer. Examples of such applications include Microsoft Outlook or Mozilla's open source Thunderbird email application. These applications are compatible with private email systems, like the one that Jack uses. What exactly is a private email system? Well, most people don't use private email systems for their personal emails anymore, so you may not be familiar with private email systems. Most of us are probably more familiar with web-based user agents attached to web-based email services. Examples of web-based user agents include Gmail, Hotmail, and Yahoo Mail. However, some people prefer private email services that can only be accessed from private user agent applications. Many businesses and workplaces will use private systems like these. For private email systems, users must have an email application like Outlook or Thunderbird installed on their computer in order to access their private emails. A private email system also means that Jack's emails are stored on Jack's private network. In fact, he may just store them right on his computer. If we look over to the right side of the illustration, we see that Jill has a web-based user agent. A web-based user agent stores Jill's emails out on the web somewhere. It also means that Jill can send and receive emails from any computer with an internet connection. Jack can only send and receive emails from within his private network, which contains a very limited number of computers. In fact, if it's a home network, Jack may only have one computer connected to it. So Jack writes an email, and then he sends it off through the internet. Jack's email must travel from his private email system through a series of servers called Message Transfer Agents, or MTAs, before it can reach its destination over on Jill at the right side of the page. Jack composes his message in his user agent, and then when he hits send, the user agent sends the email to the first message transfer agent. That message transfer agent sends the email to another message transfer agent, which sends it through the internet to a third message transfer agent. The final message transfer agent would store the message until Jill's web-based user agent requested access to new incoming emails. This user agent accesses the email for Jill, but since the user agent is web-based, the information has to travel through a completely different internet path between the user agent and Jill's computer. If Jill wanted to send a message back to Jack, the whole process would be reversed. Jill would write a message in her user agent, which appears in her web browser. When she hits send, the email would travel through the internet to her web-based email client. This email client would forward the email to a message transfer agent. The message would travel across the internet through various message transfer agents, and the final message transfer agent would keep the email in storage until Jack's user agent requested access to new incoming emails. In this illustration, you can see that the connections between message transfer agents are labeled SMTP. SMTP stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, which is the communications protocol that message transfer agents use to communicate with each other. You might think of SMTP as the language of email servers, kind of like how internet protocol is the language of the internet. Let's examine one more illustration that shows how email systems work. This one shows many of the same things that we just saw in the first illustration, but it highlights some different details. In this illustration, we see a user, Alice, sending a message to another user, Bob. Her message is composed of a short text message that says, Hi Bob, and then there's a picture of a palm tree. 
Alice sends this email using her user agent, which relays the message to a message transfer agent. The message transfer agent sends the email across the internet to a second message transfer agent. This second message transfer agent holds the email for Bob until his user agent downloads all of his new incoming emails. Bob can view the email through his user agent. This illustration helps to show us how email addressing works. When Alice addresses this email, she specifies that it should go to bob at dougj.net. Well, where exactly is dougj.net? It turns out that everything following the at in an email address is the name of a specific message transfer agent somewhere on the internet. So, in a non-technical sense, the email system asks Alice, which message transfer agent do you want me to send this email to? Alice responds, the one for dougj.net. And then the email system asks, okay, now which user at the message transfer agent do you want me to deliver this email to once it gets there? And Alice responds, send it to Bob. The email address tells the computer, send this email to the username Bob at the mail server called dougj.net. Now, every email keeps an official record of what it is and where it's been. When Alice first composes the email, all it contains is a message and an address. However, once she hits send, her user agent will attach a header that gives the recipient more information. It will add a return address, which shows the recipient who the email came from. It will also add something called a MIME header. MIME stands for Multipurpose Internet Mail Extension. It turns out that when email protocols were first designed, they were only designed to handle plain text messages. However, MIME allows email systems to work around this limitation. The MIME header allows emails to carry different design elements that go beyond plain text, elements such as images, special fonts, and file attachments. The MIME header on an email will explain what the email contains. In this case, it will say that Alice's email contains text and an image. When the message goes to the first message transfer agent, that message transfer agent leaves a header of its own so that there's a record of where the email has been. All subsequent message transfer agents will leave headers of their own as well. In this illustration, there are only two message transfer agents, and so the email only picks up two message transfer agent headers. The email arrives at Bob's user agent with all of these headers attached. In many cases, the headers will end up being much longer than the email message itself. To reduce clutter, most modern user agents won't display all of these headers, at least not by default. In Bob's case, he can only see the message and a reduced header that tells him who sent it. However, user agents will allow you to see the full header if you ask for it. You could try this with one of your own emails. To view one of these full headers in your user agent, open an email and look for an option that says something like view full header or display message details or something like that. Normally, you wouldn't have much reason to be interested in these headers. That's why most modern user agents hide them but sometimes they are useful. For example, it is useful that a header keeps a record of where an email has been. Sometimes cyber criminals will send forged emails that pretend to come from a trusted source, say your workplace or your grandma. But if you learn to read email headers, you can check for yourself which message transfer agents the email originated from. Cyber criminals can fake the return address on an email but they cannot fake the message transfer agent headers. If you receive a suspicious email that claims to be from your grandma, it's possible to check the detailed header of the email to determine whether it really came from the same message transfer agent as your grandma's other emails. Okay, that's all for now about email systems. Of course, there is much more to learn about how email works, but if you followed along with this lecture, then you probably already know more than most casual users do. In the next video, we'll talk about security threats that come through email, and we'll identify some ways to avoid, or at least to minimize, the
In this video, we are going to discuss different kinds of malicious software. By malicious, we mean that this software is intended to harm computer users, to irritate them, or to steal information from them. In cybersecurity lingo, we combine the words malicious and software together into a single word, malware. In this lecture, I'm going to define several common varieties of malware, viruses, worms, Trojan horses, and bots. The first type of malware that I'm going to talk about is viruses. Most of you have probably heard the term computer virus before, but what exactly is a computer virus? In the traditional definition, a computer virus is an unwanted program that attaches itself onto a host file on a computer. This is similar to real biological viruses, which attach themselves to host cells in a body. There is another analogy between computer viruses and biological viruses based on the way that they spread between hosts. Viruses cannot spread from person to person unless those two people interact somehow. For example, by sneezing on one another. <coughs> computer viruses work in a similar way. A computer virus copies itself, but those copies don't just spread to new computers on their own. Instead, a host must do the spreading somehow. There are many ways that computer users can accidentally spread computer viruses. Some common ones include sharing infected USB devices, sharing infected files on peer-to-peer -peer file sharing networks, or sharing infected files in emails. The second type of malware that I'm going to talk about is worms. On the traditional definition, worms are self-sufficient programs. We just saw that viruses live in host files on a computer. But worms are programs that hide out on a computer without the aid of a host file. A virus is just a string of malicious code that can't function without a host, but a worm is its own separate program. Unlike viruses, worms are often able to spread themselves throughout a computer network. When a worm becomes attached to a computer, it normally tries to spread to all the other computers on the same network as the original host computer. It doesn't matter if it's a wired network or a wireless network. A worm can spread itself using either kind. In fact, the network itself is often the target of a worm. The idea is that by infecting all or many of the computers on a network, a worm can slow down the network itself, rendering the network useless. The third type of malware that I'm going to talk about here is Trojan horses. Trojan horses are like worms in that they are normally independent programs that run on your computer. They don't need to attach themselves to a host file in the same way that viruses do. But Trojan horses don't necessarily spread like worms do. What makes Trojan horses unique is that they spread by tricking computer users into voluntarily downloading them. A Trojan horse will appear to be some kind of valuable computer file, but when users download that file, they receive malware that they weren't expecting. Just as the Trojan horse of Greek mythology appeared to be a gift, but was actually filled with menacing Greek raiders, Trojan horse software will appear to be an enticing download, but it will be full of menacing malware. The fourth type of malware that I'm going to talk about here is bots. Bot is short for robot. Most of the time, when we think of robots, we think of physical machines that can perform tasks that are normally performed by human beings. The term bot in cybersecurity lingo is similar. A bot is a malicious program that automatically performs functions on your computer that are normally performed by the user. For example, a bot might send emails, or pull up web pages, or change your computer's settings, or many other things, and all that without the user's permission. Now, sometimes a bot is simply programmed to do those things on its own without any input, but sometimes bots are actually capable of receiving commands from a third-party user called a bot master. Bot masters use bots to control your computer without your consent or even your awareness. 
Like a worm, bots can replicate themselves. However, unlike a worm, a bot is usually very careful about replication. Worms are normally programmed to replicate very quickly. The rapid spread of a worm can create so much traffic on a computer network that the network slows down or completely crashes. Indeed, this is often the purpose of worms, to damage a network. Bots, on the other hand, usually replicate relatively slowly so that they can avoid being noticed. Similarly, bots are frequently designed so that they will run on a computer completely undetected. Now, viruses are normally designed to damage a computer. But bots are designed to run smoothly along with other computer programs. But that doesn't mean that bots aren't harmful. A bot can receive commands from a remote bot master, and so a bot gives partial control of your computer over to some other user at some other location. And that can be a very harmful thing. Throughout this video, I've referred to four distinct types of malware. Viruses, worms, Trojan horses, and bots. However, in the real world, boundaries are fuzzy between all the different kinds of malware. It can be difficult to categorize real pieces of malware as just viruses or just worms. Sometimes, a piece of malware will attach itself to a file, like a virus does but it will have the capacity to spread itself like a worm does. Or maybe it will be a Trojan horse download that leaves a bot on your computer. Now, the term virus has become the catch-all term for discussing malware in casual conversation. But as you can see, there are a great many varieties of malware out there, each with their own purposes, their own strengths, and their own weaknesses. Okay, that's all the further we'll go in this video. In the next lesson, we'll talk more about what malware can do to your computer.
we'll discuss the following four wireless security threats. Sniffing, rogue routers, evil twin routers, and unauthorized connections. At the beginning here, I'm going to remind you that these threats apply to Wi-Fi internet, but they do not apply to mobile cellular networks, which use different technologies besides Wi-Fi. So when you're using Wi-Fi on your phone, this lesson applies. But when you're using data on your phone, it probably doesn't. Wireless security threat number one is sniffing. Have you ever seen a movie where somebody is having a private telephone conversation on a landline telephone, and then somebody else picks up a different phone somewhere else in the house and eavesdrops on that conversation? Wireless sniffing is a similar kind of eavesdropping that can happen on public, wireless internet connections. If you're in, say, a coffee shop surfing the web, a cybercriminal within range of that wireless network can use a variety of methods to intercept the signals between your computer and the wireless router. They can intercept the information that is sent from the wireless router to your computer, and they can also intercept the information that your computer sends back to the wireless router. By default, computers are configured not to sniff, but there is free and legal software that can reconfigure a computer to run in what is known as promiscuous mode. A promiscuous computer sniffs all of the wireless traffic on a network. For those of you who are watching this lesson as part of a class that uses this textbook, there's a diagram in chapter 9 that illustrates what we're talking about. We'll look at that diagram here. If you aren't using this textbook, don't worry about it, just follow along with the lesson. This illustration shows how computers normally function on a network, that is, when they're not sniffing traffic. Over on the right side of the page, we have a wireless router that has been named MSP Wireless. We also have three computers connected to this wireless network, User 1, User 2, and Alice's computer. The red dotted line here represents Alice's computer sending a packet of information to the router. It's requesting the homepage for CNN.com. Normally, this information goes out in all directions and is readable by every device on the network. But computers are normally configured to ignore this kind of information, so only Alice's computer and the router are actually involved in the transaction. User 1 and User 2 are configured to ignore Alice's computer's Wi-Fi traffic. Here's an illustration that shows the same situation, only one computer has been configured into promiscuous mode. When Alice submits her password, which is the word bananas, to the website that she's trying to log into, her password information is available to every device on the wireless network. User number one is still ignoring this information, which is what he or she is supposed to do. The router is still listening to this information, which is what it's supposed to do, but user number two has now turned into sniffer number one. This user is secretly observing Alice's login credentials. Alice can prevent sniffing in several ways. One is to use a secure wireless network. On a secure wireless network, all users on the network still have access to each other's internet traffic, but this traffic is encrypted so that other users aren't able to read it. Another way to prevent sniffing is to stick to websites that use HTTPS. HTTPS is a set of communication rules that some internet connected devices use to communicate with each other. HTTPS encrypts all traffic between users and a given web page. Again, the traffic is still sniffable on the wireless network, but it's garbled by the encryption. Finally, users may negate sniffing by using a virtual private network or VPN. I won't go into the details of VPNs here, but suffice it to say that VPNs are another method of internet encryption that renders internet traffic unreadable to all but designated members of a network. So, in short, the solution to sniffing is encryption. All three of these techniques are different ways of encrypting wireless traffic. The radio waves that carry your wireless internet signal will always be out in the public airspace for anybody to intercept. But if your data is encrypted, it will be meaningless and useless to those potential sniffers. Wireless security threat number two is rogue routers. A rogue router is an illegitimate router. Attackers set up rogue routers so that they can prey on casual internet users who connect to those routers. A cyber criminal might come along and set up a rogue router anywhere where people expect there to be free Wi-Fi. So, for example, airports are popular locations for rogue routers. 
attackers will give the rogue routers plausible names, like free airport Wi-Fi, so that they can attract users to connect to them. But once users are connected, the attackers simply use those rogue routers to sniff the wireless traffic on them. They might even ask users to set up user accounts for the network, and in this way, the attackers try to snatch usernames, passwords, and other identification information from unwitting users. In fact, because some airports charge for Wi-Fi, some attackers will even go so far as to charge users to work on the rogue routers. Users will pay these fees because they were expecting to pay a fee anyway, so the victims are charged a fee to be cyber-attacked. Rogue routers are particularly tricky at travel hubs like airports and bus stations. In those situations, travelers are vulnerable. They have little time and very few resources to spend on their own cyber defense. Furthermore, the attackers that set up routers in transportation hubs may also be travelers themselves. They might not live anywhere near the place that they're attacking, and after a couple of hours of sniffing and fishing, they might simply hop on a plane and fly to the next targeted airport. But although rogue routers are particularly nasty at travel hubs, they are by no means limited to travel hubs. Rogue routers might appear anywhere where you would expect to find a potential cluster of wireless networks. Maybe coffee shops, public squares, apartment buildings, or other places like that. So you might be thinking, gee, it sounds like any public router could be a rogue router. And it's certainly possible. Between rogue routers and unsecured networks, public Wi-Fi connections can be pretty dicey. Now this isn't to say that you should avoid them entirely, but you should definitely proceed with caution anytime you connect to a public Wi-Fi network. Wireless security threat number three is evil twin routers. A close relative to the rogue router is the evil twin router. Like a rogue router, an evil twin router is a router that has been set up for the purpose of attacking users. With an evil twin router, cyber criminals take advantage of people who allow their computers to automatically connect to a public network. For example, a college or university might have a campus-wide wireless internet connection named University Wi-Fi. Routers connecting to that network are probably installed in strategic locations all across campus. Attackers will sometimes set up alternate routers with the exact same name as a known legitimate network. So if your computer is set up to automatically connect to their network named Library Wi-Fi, it will connect to whatever router it finds with that name. If there is more than one router with that name, it will connect to the one with the strongest signal. If the evil twin router happens to be the strongest connection from where you're working, your computer might automatically connect to the evil twin router without you knowing it. Once you're connected to the evil twin router, you are susceptible to all of the familiar attacks, especially wireless sniffing. Wireless security threat number four is unauthorized connections. So far, we have discussed wireless networks from the perspective of a user who's connecting to a publicly available network. Now let's consider an important security issue that comes up for wireless router owners who manage their own wireless networks at home. This issue is unauthorized connections. If you have an unsecure wireless network at home, you leave your home network open to unauthorized connections by neighbors or anybody else within the broadcast radius of your router. This practice of connecting to unsecured wireless networks without the owner's permission is sometimes called piggybacking. In many cases, piggybacking is more of a nuisance than a threat. That's because having extra users connected to your router can slow down your internet connection. But there can be other costs associated with piggybacking as well. Financial costs, security costs, and legal costs. You could incur financial costs from piggybacking if your internet plan includes a monthly limit on the amount of data that you can download or upload. If you have a data limit, then you probably don't want to unknowingly share your internet connection with piggybackers, such as neighbors or people parked on the street near your home. There can also be security costs to piggybacking. Unauthorized network users might be able to access your router's settings and change them to make your network less secure. And as per usual, you have to consider the possibility of sniffing attacks from other users connected to the network. Perhaps most importantly, there are potential legal consequences to piggybacking. If somebody connects to the internet from your router, then all of their online activity can be traced back to your network. Any illegal activities that they participate in, such as uploading or downloading malware, pirating media, or downloading illegal pornography, will appear to be happening in your home. 
For example, back in 2011, the FBI raided the home of a man in Buffalo, New York on the suspicion that he was downloading child pornography. The ensuing investigation eventually revealed that a neighbor had used the man's unsecure wireless connection to download the pornography. So fortunately, in this case, the innocent man didn't get into serious trouble. But his unsecure wireless network made him a suspect in a very serious criminal investigation that could have had dire consequences if he hadn't been vindicated. Even if your neighbors are all good, trustworthy people, it still pays to secure your home wireless network. Some cyber criminals drive around neighborhoods looking for unsecure networks that they can exploit. Okay, let's review. We've introduced four wireless security threats. Sniffing, rogue routers, evil twin routers, and unauthorized connections. All of these threats are relevant to Wi-Fi internet connections, but they don't necessarily apply to mobile cellular networks. In the next lesson, we'll discuss public Wi-Fi connections.
administering wireless networks. Many of you probably have your own wireless networks in your own homes. The primary security threat for home Wi-Fi networks is unauthorized access, sometimes called piggybacking. If somebody accesses your wireless network without you knowing it, they can potentially sniff your wireless traffic while you're using your devices at home. Perhaps even worse, they could use your internet connection to commit cybercrimes, such as fraud or buying and selling drugs. Such activities could be traced back to your router. Attackers know this. Some of them even drive around neighborhoods looking for unsecured wireless connections. Sometimes when cybercriminals find good, accessible, unsecure connections, they will post them on online maps that direct a criminal community towards good places to access unsecure Wi-Fi. Knowing these potential threats, it's a good idea to keep your wireless network secure. In this lesson, we'll cover six network administration tips that can help you to keep your wireless network as secure as possible. Use a strong router password, enable wireless security encryption, enable router firewalls, disable SSID broadcast, filter MAC addresses, and turn off your router. Network administration tip number one is to use a strong router password. To access and to change the security settings on a router, a user will type in the router's IP address into a web browser, and this address will pull up the router's administration page. The settings on this administration page are usually password protected, so that not just anybody can change the security settings on your router. Most routers come from the factory with a default password, and many users never bother to change this password. You should make sure that you've changed your router password to a strong password that you'll be able to remember. Attackers often know the default administration passwords for various routers. If they have the administration password for your router, then attackers can potentially log into your router as an administrator and then change your security settings to their liking. For guidance on choosing a strong password, I recommend that you go back and watch lesson 11, which is titled, Choosing a Strong Password. Network administration tip number two is to enable wireless signal encryption. Most routers come with some kind of security option that will allow you to encrypt the wireless radio signals between your computer and your router. Make sure that this option is enabled on your router and make sure that you're using the strongest encryption options that are available to you. The most secure encryption option currently available is called WPA2. This option won't be available on some older routers or maybe for some older computers, but if it is available, then you should use it. The next most secure encryption option is called WPA. It's a step down, but it's better than nothing. The least most secure encryption option is called WEP. Some older computers cannot read either WPA2 or WPA, and so for those computers, WEP will have to do. WEP is the weakest encryption option available, but it's still a little better than no encryption at all. Network administration tip number three is to enable router firewalls. As you may remember from other lessons, firewalls protect computers from receiving unauthorized and unrequested traffic through their internet connections. Your computer probably has a firewall, but your router probably also has a firewall. It's a good idea to keep your router's firewall turned on, even if you have another firewall running on your computer. There's no real downside to having multiple firewalls running at any given time, and running multiple firewalls has some advantages. Your router firewall might have strengths that cover the weaknesses of your computer's firewall. Network administration tip number four is to disable SSID broadcast. Every router has a name. A router's name is also called its service set identifier, or SSID. The SSID is the name that appears on your computer's network management application when you search for available wireless networks. Routers come factory configured so that they broadcast the SSID for everybody to see. This configuration makes sense for public internet connections, such as the one that you would find in a cafe or at an airport. It makes less sense for private internet connections in your home. If you already know the SSID that you want to connect to, then your computer can find and connect to it without the router broadcasting the SSID out to the public. Network administrators can disable SSID broadcast on a router. 
with this broadcast disabled, it's more difficult for outside attackers to even see whether you have a Wi-Fi connection in your house or apartment. They will likely just pass over you if you aren't broadcasting your SSID. Network administration tip number five is to filter MAC addresses. Internet-ready computers connect to the internet through a network card that plugs into the computer's motherboard. Every network card has a unique address called a Media Access Control Address, or MAC address. You should note that the word MAC in this context doesn't have anything in particular to do with MAC computers associated with Apple technologies. This resemblance is just a coincidence. Every internet-ready computer, be it a Mac, a PC, or anything else, will be associated with a unique MAC address. Most routers can filter computers by their MAC addresses. Such a feature is a powerful security tool. If this feature is enabled on your router, then only computers with approved MAC addresses can access your Wi-Fi connection. You will be able to add and to remove MAC address permissions in your router's administrative settings. Network administration tip number six is to turn off your router. It's a good idea to turn off your router if you're not going to be using it for an extended period of time. Attackers can't attack a router that's turned off. As an added bonus, you'll save a few dollars on electricity every year if you turn off your router while you're asleep or while you're away from home. Okay, let's review. We've covered six network administration tips. Using a strong router password, enabling wireless signal encryption, enabling router firewalls, disabling SSID broadcast, filtering MAC addresses, and turning off your router. That's all of the tips that I have for you for now. If you have a router, you should go play with it. See if you can adjust any of the settings that I've recommended here. If you have trouble, try searching the web for a user's manual or for a helpful form that answers your questions. Once you figure out how to access your router's administrative settings, and once you familiarize yourself with the administration page, I imagine that you'll find that the tips in this lecture are pretty easy to put into practice. In the next video, we're going to discuss some security considerations for users of social media. In this lecture, we're going to discuss some of the privacy issues that we encounter on social media. There are a lot of different ways that you could define privacy. So what is privacy? One helpful definition might look like this. Privacy is having control over who knows information about you, what information they know, and when they can know it. If you have a good deal of control over who knows what about you and when they know it, then most people would probably agree that you enjoy a high degree of privacy. Participation in social media always requires a sacrifice of privacy. Social media users usually show other people what they look like, who they spend their time with, what kinds of things they like to buy and to do, and what some of their opinions might be. On the one hand, there's nothing necessarily wrong with any of that. The whole point of a social network is to use the power of the internet to open up and to share with other people. On the other hand, the privacy trade-offs in social networking can become a problem when people share more than they thought they were sharing, or when they end up regretting something that they have shared previously. We're going to address three social media privacy issues in this lecture. Friend gluttony, copying and pasting, and employers. Social media privacy issue number one is friend gluttony. Some people strive to have as many friends or followers on social media as possible. When friending goes too far, we call this friend gluttony. On social media, members of your social network are sometimes called friends. In the real world, we usually mean something different when we talk about friends than what we mean when we talk about friends on social media. Social media friends are often people who we don't know very well, perhaps people that we met at a party, associates who we know through a friend, or people who we haven't seen in a long, long time. In the real world, most of us wouldn't share the same kinds of private information with distant associates that we would share with our closest friends. But social media do not automatically make distinctions between close friends and non-close friends. To social media, a friend is a friend, and its default settings will allow all of your friends equal access to all of the private information that you share. For this reason, it's a good idea to choose your friends wisely. Furthermore, because social media sites use words like friend, 
Sometimes users feel like they're being unfriendly if they don't accept friend requests. Some users think, gee, if I reject a friend request, I'm saying that I dislike this person. But that's not true. All a friend rejection on social media means is that you aren't, at this time, allowing a particular person into your private network. The issue might not be that you dislike them, the issue might just be that you don't really know them that well. Why should you feel obligated to let somebody into your private network, especially if you don't know them that well? After all, it's your privacy and it's your network, so you don't have to fall into the trap of feeling obligated to friend everybody who sends you a friend request. And you don't have to feel obligated to send a friend request to everybody that you meet in person. Another trap to avoid is the trap of letting your number of social media contacts affect your sense of self-worth. Some people feel good if they have a large network, and some people feel bad if they have a small network. Such feelings lead some social media users to become friend gluttons. Now, I'm not trying to invalidate the feelings you might have about your social media presence, but I would like to caution you against participating in unsafe behaviors based on those feelings. It's okay to have a lot of friends, but you should limit your friend network to people who you have some kind of genuine relationship with. A good rule of thumb is to limit your network to people whom you feel inclined to wish a happy birthday to when their birthday comes around. If you don't like a person enough or care about them enough to take a moment to wish them happy birthday, well, then maybe you aren't close enough to that person to share your private information with them. Information such as pictures, relationship status, opinions, contact information, and maybe even your current location. Social media privacy issue number two is copying and pasting. Now, so far, I've been saying that the word friend is kind of misleading in the context of social media. I've been saying that media friends aren't always really friends, just members of your private online social network. But I should point out that a social network is only a private network in a limited sense of the word private. Once you put information out on the internet, it really isn't all that private anymore. Digital information is extraordinarily easy to copy and to share. Anybody who can see your social media profile can copy any of the text, the photos, or the information on that profile, and then share it with whomever they want. So be careful whom you add to your network, and even more importantly, be careful what you share. Privacy issue number three is employers. You should keep in mind that the things that you share on social networks could come back to haunt you later. If you're applying for jobs, you should assume that your potential employers will search for your public social media profiles before hiring you. You should make sure that any publicly viewable portions of your social media profiles represent you in the best possible light. Some social media services allow you to see your profile as it appears to different people. You can see how your page appears to the public, or you can choose one of your contacts or followers and check out how your profile appears to that person. You should examine your profile from several different perspectives and adjust your privacy settings so it appears how you want it to. It would also be a good idea to search for your own name with a few different search engines, Google, Bing, Yahoo, etc., just to see what kinds of information potential employers might see when they search for you. Some employers will go so far as to ask you for your social media passwords during a job interview, so that they can see an unfiltered view of your private profile and private network before they make the decision to hire you. Now, some states are beginning to pass laws against such practices, but in most places, this remains a legal demand. Many of you, I'm sure, wouldn't want to share your password with your employer, so it would be a good idea to prepare a courteous refusal to such requests before you go into an interview. You could say something like, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm very cautious with private information like this. You're free to look at my public profile, but I have to keep my personal passwords to myself. If a potential employer will not accept a courteous no for an answer, then you'll have to make the difficult decision whether it's worth working for an employer like that. On the one hand, you might need the job. On the other hand, do you really want to work for somebody that doesn't respect your boundaries? Breaches of privacy on social networks can of course be embarrassing or upsetting, but they can also have severe, lasting effects on a person's career or social life. For example, in 2009, a Georgia high school teacher resigned 
after her district received an email complaint about content on her Facebook page. The email presented several pictures of the teacher holding alcoholic beverages while she was on vacation. The email was anonymous, but it claimed to come from a concerned parent. The teacher ended up resigning over the controversy. Since her resignation, this teacher has claimed that she had marked those vacation pictures as private, and she has also claimed that she was not friends with any of her students or with any of her students' parents. That might all be true, but still, somebody with access to her Facebook pictures clearly made copies of them and emailed them to her boss. One of her Facebook, quote, friends, whomever it was, made the decision to violate this teacher's privacy by spreading these pictures beyond their intended audience. Now, I'm not trying to say that this teacher is at fault or that she deserved to lose her job over such a trivial controversy, but this episode highlights many of the privacy issues that come up with social networking. It shows that Facebook friends aren't necessarily true friends. It shows that online information is easy to copy and to share. It shows you that you never really know what somebody will consider offensive or inappropriate. And it shows that some employers are very interested in the private information that you post online. Okay, let's review. In this lesson, we discussed three social media privacy issues. Friend gluttony, copying and pasting, and issues with employers. In the next lesson, we'll discuss how these privacy trade-offs security. In this lecture, we're going to discuss two issues of personal security that are related to the privacy trade-offs on social networks. We're going to see how some burglars use social networking to choose their victims, and we'll see how some cyber attackers use social media to spread malware to users like you. Social media security threat number one is burglars on social media. Did you know that many burglars are devoted researchers? It's true. The more a burglar knows about a target, the better judgments a burglar can make about the potential risks and rewards of burglarizing that target. There are many kinds of information that burglars research, but the most important one is this. Will anybody be home at the time of the burglary? Modern burglars are turning to social media sites to discover when residents will be out of town, as well as other information that's relevant to the burglary. Just imagine all the information that a clever burglar could pick up from a carelessly constructed social media profile. For example, let's consider an imaginary user named Cher. Cher posts a status update that says, Can't wait to take the kids to Cartoonland theme park for spring break. A burglar who's scanning through social media pages might stumble across this status, and so he might take a closer look at Cher's page. Scrolling through Cher's profile, he sees that she gave her husband, Floyd, a new flat-screen TV for Christmas. He also sees that Floyd gave Cher a shimmering pearl necklace. Wow, antique jewels, priceless, Cher writes in the caption of the picture. The burglar also sees that Cher has two small children in elementary school. There are several pictures of the outside of Cher's house, and the burglar is able to figure out the layout of the house from the pictures. Scrolling through a few more pictures, he sees that Cher's only pet is an adorable cat named Percy, with no evidence of a guard dog. The burglar finds that Cher hasn't posted her address on any of her social media accounts. So, the burglar looks up her address in a local directory, which only takes him a few seconds. The burglar takes a few more seconds to look up the nearest elementary school, and he uses that school's academic calendar to figure out which week Cher's children will have off for spring break. He sees that spring break begins the week of April 6th, and so he checks his schedule. He finds no scheduling conflicts, and so the burglar decides to watch Cher's house on the night of April 8th, and if nobody appears to be home, to rob it on the night of April 9th. When Cher and Floyd return from their Cartoon Land theme park vacation, they find that the latch on the back window of their house has been broken. Inside, several precious items are missing, including Cher's jewelry, Floyd's flat-screen TV, the kids' piggy banks, and Percy the Cat. That's an imaginary example, but real burglaries like this happen all the time. Many burglars research the houses that they burglarize, and social media makes this research much easier for them. Think about it. Could a burglar use your updates, your photos, or your location check-ins to determine how you are vulnerable or when you'll be away from home? To protect your own personal security, 
you should be conscious of how information that you post on social media could be used against you. When you're building a social media profile, it's a good idea to leave off the kinds of information that you normally provide when you make an online purchase or when you fill out your tax return. What kinds of information is that? I'm talking about things like your email address, your physical address, your phone number, your credit card numbers, social security numbers, driver's license numbers, PIN numbers, or any other identification information like those things. Some users won't even use their real name on social media. They'll use a nickname or a misspelling of their name, or maybe they'll use their middle name in place of their first or last name. Using a different name adds an extra layer of security to your profile. Your real friends and family will know who you are, but anonymous stalkers won't be able to find you and to identify you quite so easily. You should examine your own social media profiles, especially the parts that are visible to the public, to friends of friends, or to people on shared networks like university networks or citywide networks. When you examine your profile, try to look at it with the eyes of a burglar. Delete information that a burglar could use against you. You should also look at your profile through the eyes of a hacker. Look especially for any information that a hacker could use to guess the answers to security questions that you use for online profiles. As I suggested in a previous lesson, you should tell lies when you set up the answers to your security questions, because telling lies makes security questions more difficult to guess. But if, for the sake of convenience, you decide to take the calculated risk of telling the truth on your security questions, you should remember to never accidentally post the answers to your security questions on your social media profiles. If your security question is, what is the name of your favorite pet? Don't go and post a picture of your cat on Facebook and then caption it, this is Percy, the greatest pet of all time. Some experts also recommend that you not post plain headshots of yourself online. Headshots like the ones that appear on a passport or a driver's license. Such photos could be used to make fake IDs with your picture and your name on them. And remember, as the burglary example above shows, it's a very bad idea to post location check-ins or vacation photos that tell the world when your house is unoccupied. Your physical location is an important piece of security information, so be thoughtful about what you reveal about your location online. Of course, the whole point of using social media is that you want to share information with other people. So if you use social media, you're obviously not going to withhold absolutely everything about yourself. But you should train your brain to think like a crook. Before you post information on social media, consider how that information could be used against you. Social media security threat number two is phishing scams and malware. Let's take a moment now to consider malware and phishing. We've already talked about both of these topics in other lessons, but now let's look at how malware and phishing scams can be aided by social media. Several malware and phishing scams are common on social networking sites. For example, a worm called Kubeface that spread on Facebook appeared in 2008. Kubeface would first appear on one's Facebook feed as a curious, strange, or enticing link, something that was apparently posted by a friend. But when a user clicked on the link, the user would be directed to a website with either a drive-by download of the Kubeface worm or with a Trojan horse that disguised the Kubeface software as a safe file download. Once a user downloaded Kubeface from either of these two methods, Kubeface would use keylogging software to steal the user's Facebook credentials. Once Kubeface discovered the user's Facebook username and password, it would hijack the user's Facebook account, and it would use that account to post more links to the malicious Kubeface website. Worms like Kubeface do not infect your computer directly through Facebook. Instead, they infect it through other web pages shared on Facebook. On Facebook and other social media services, you should be careful what you click on. You can't be sure whether or not a friend really posted something on her Facebook account unless you happen to be looking over her shoulder when she posts it. If you are remotely suspicious of something that a Facebook friend shared with you, you can just call that friend on the phone and ask them about it. You don't have to click on it. So although Kubeface uses Facebook, Kubeface isn't really native to Facebook. 
because it directs users to outside web pages. There is another kind of software, however, that is native to Facebook that you should be careful about, and that software is applications. Be cautious with Facebook applications or any other social media applications. Applications such as games always require users to grant the application access to some of the user's profile information. Legitimate applications use this information to direct targeted advertisements toward users. That may not be pleasant, but it's generally not a security breach. There are several illegitimate applications, however, that simply harvest your information for sale, for identity theft, or for phishing scams. Illegitimate applications could take many forms, and so you should research all applications before you agree to install them or to share any information with them. And with any application that you install, it's a good security practice to withhold whatever permissions you possibly can from the application. You should also be cautious with advertisements. Scammers will sometimes use targeted ads on social media to direct users to phishing websites. If an ad tells you that you have won an amazing prize, or if it offers you a deal that's too good to be true, like a $1 iPad or airfare that's been discounted at 90% off, then you should ignore that ad. If you click on an ad like that, it will probably direct you to a phishing website, which will claim that you must enter private sensitive information in order to claim your prize. Okay, in this video, we've looked at two threats, burglars on social media and phishing and malware scams on social media. In the next lesson, we're going to discuss social engineering, which is a set of practices that scammers use to concept of social engineering and I'm going to introduce a number of social engineering threats that you should be aware of. What is social engineering? Social engineering is when an attacker creates a social situation that encourages a potential victim to let his or her guard down. Social engineering schemes usually play some kind of mind games with their target. Here's a good example of social engineering. There was once a bank that hired security testers to discover vulnerabilities in their security systems. The testers loaded malware onto several USB drives and left them lying on the ground outside of the bank, where employees would see them on their way into work. When employees noticed a USB drive on the ground, they tended to scoop it up and to bring it into work with them. Once inside, they would plug the USB drive into a computer to see if they could figure out who it belonged to. Unbeknownst to the bank employees, these USB drives had malware loaded onto them. Plugging the drives into a computer caused them to upload the malware onto the computer. Since this was just a security test, the malware wasn't harmful. Even so, this is a good example of social engineering. The security testers knew that bank employees would feel curious when they saw the abandoned flash drives on the ground. They also knew that many employees would feel like they were doing the right thing if they plugged the USB drive into a computer because they might be able to figure out who the drive belonged to. The security testers engineered the situation so that common social practices would lead the employees to put the company's computers at risk. There are many other kinds of social engineering. Let's look at four common social engineering threats. Instant messages, fake antivirus or scareware, emails, and phone calls. Social engineering threat number one is instant messages. Attackers can use instant messaging services like Skype, Facebook Chat, or Google Hangouts to help spread malware. It's not that they will deliver the malware directly through the instant message. That's not a real risk. What generally happens instead is that an attacker will embed malicious links into a message. These malicious messages might play on feelings like curiosity, urgency, or insecurity. For example, an attacker with the messenger handle Windows Help Team might send you an instant message that says, Warning! Your system is out of date. Urgent Windows system update required. Please download vital updates at www.microsoft-updates.com backslash vital. What the attacker is doing here is trying to scare you so that you won't read the link closely or think too hard about whether or not it's a good idea to click on it. And trust me, it's not a good idea to click on hyperlinks in a message like this. No legitimate software company would send you a scary message like this to notify you about a software update.
Or to imagine another example, an attacker with the messenger handle CrushFinder might send you a message saying, two of your chat contacts and four other cutie pies are searching for you at CrushFinder.com. Click here to learn who. Again, the attacker is trying to provoke an emotion or curiosity-driven click before you think too hard about why you might not want to click on such a link. Social engineering threat number two is fake antivirus or scareware. Another social engineering tactic is the fake antivirus or scareware pop-up. Fake antivirus windows are pop-up messages that are designed to look like real antivirus messages. In this example, the fake antivirus window is designed to look much like a real Windows Explorer window. But if you look closely, you can see that it's actually appearing within a web browser, not within Windows Explorer itself. Fake antivirus windows will generally use a lot of scary looking red icons and red text to tell a user that their computer is absolutely crawling with malware. The goal is to put the user into a state of fright or confusion so that users will try to interact with the fake antivirus window. If a user clicks on it, then the fake antivirus window will take the user to a malicious web page containing malware, perhaps in the form of a drive-by download. Attackers use two common methods to deliver fake antivirus windows. The first is just to use a web-based pop-up. If you get to a web-based fake antivirus window, you should close it but without clicking on it, and then you should navigate away from whatever page you were on that delivered that pop-up to you. The second way that attackers deliver fake antivirus windows is through malware that's already running on your computer. Certain types of malware will create these fake antivirus windows on your computer, and then if you click on the windows, you'll be directed to a web page that contains even more malware. If you frequently see fake antivirus pop-ups on your computer, that could be a sign that your computer has a malware infection on it. Social engineering threat number three is emails. Email is a popular tool for spreading malware. But for you to get malware from an email, you must be tricked into interacting with that email somehow. You have to click on a hyperlink or download and open a malicious attachment. So how do attackers encourage users to interact with malicious emails? Well, they use social engineering tactics. This first example shows an email designed to encourage the recipient to open a malicious attachment. Let's read the email. The subject line says, Worm Alert. Dear customer, our robot has detected an abnormal activity from your IP address on sending emails. Probably it is connected with the last epidemic of Worm, which does not have official patches at the moment. We recommend you to install this patch to remove Worm files and stop email sending. Otherwise, your account will be locked. We had archived the patch because the worm can modify unpacked exe files. You should open the archive file, enter the password, and run the patch immediately. Password, dog83, from the customer support center robot. This email claims that some kind of automated service has detected abnormal activity coming from the recipient's computer. It tells the recipient that they probably have a malware infection on their computer and that the solution for this infection is to download the attached file. If the recipient of this email downloads and opens the attached file, they will no doubt end up with a malware infection, perhaps one that is very similar to the infection that they thought that they were fixing. Remember, you should approach unexpected and unknown email attachments with suspicion. You shouldn't open attachments from unknown sources. If you feel in the least bit suspicious of an attachment, you can always call the sender on the phone and ask about it before you actually download the attachment. And remember, no legitimate software company will ever send you a software patch in an email. You should ignore and delete any emails that claim to contain software patches. This next example shows an email that has no attachments but is instead designed to encourage the recipient to click on malicious hyperlinks. Let's read it too. The subject line says, Dr. Gregory has sent you a photo from vacation on November 30th at six o'clock in 2006. Dr. Gregory has sent you a photo from vacation. Click here to view the photo Dr. Gregory has sent from vacation. Click here to share your photos with a friend. At Vacation Photos Online, we care about your privacy. We have sent you this notification to facilitate your use as a member of our service. If you don't want to receive emails like this to your email account in the future, please click below. 
This email claims that the links lead to a photo sharing service which Dr. Gregory is using to share his vacation photos with you. In reality, the links will just take the recipient to web pages that are loaded with malware or scams. What do you think? Would you have fallen for this email? Would you have clicked on any of these links? Would you have fallen for it if, instead of Dr. Gregory, it said that it was from somebody that you know, say, a friend from school or a relative? Here's an example that doesn't have anything to do with malware, but it's still a scam. The subject line says, Help! I'm writing this with tears in my eyes. My family and I came over here to London, United Kingdom for a short vacation. Unfortunately, we were mugged at the park of the hotel where we stayed. All cash and credit card were stolen off us, but luckily for us, we still have our passports with us. We've been to the embassy and the police here, but they're not helping issues at all, and our flight leaves in a few hours from now, but we're having problems settling the hotel bills, and the hotel manager won't let us leave until we settle the bills. Well, I really need your financial assistance. Please let me know if you can help us out. I'm freaked out at the moment. Joe. Poor Joe, right? This email appeals to the recipient's sense of sympathy. If this story were true, many readers probably would want to help out poor Joe and his family. But of course, this is a trick to steal money from do-gooders like you and me. Notice that the scammer used a common American name, Joe, for the supposed victim in this story. The scammer probably sent this email to hundreds or thousands of recipients, and no doubt many of them really do know somebody named Joe who have families. So it's possible that the recipient would think that they knew who the email came from, even if they really didn't. This next email pretends to come from the recipient's bank, Wells Fargo. You might wonder, well how did the scammers know which bank their targets would use? Well they probably didn't know. Wells Fargo is just a big bank, and if the scammers send out hundreds or thousands of scam emails, they're bound to contact several Wells Fargo customers just by accident. This is especially true if they target people who live in an area with a Wells Fargo branch nearby. For example, they might target a university community at a school that has a Wells Fargo branch on campus. They would know that a number of students are sure to open up accounts at the campus branch. Let's read the email. The subject line says, Account Deactivated. Dear Valued Wells Fargo Member, Due to concerns for the safety and integrity of the Wells Fargo account, we have issued this warning message. We have noticed that your Wells Fargo online account needs to be updated once again. Please enter your online account information because we have to verify all of the online accounts after we have updated our Wells Fargo online banking site. To verify your online account and access your bank account, please click on the link below. And then there's some links. And notice at the bottom says, This email was sent to all our Wells Fargo customers. Recently, we have found that many accounts were hacked. This phishing email is pretty straightforward. It claims that the recipient needs to update her Wells Fargo online account. No doubt the hyperlinks on this email will lead the recipient to a fake Wells Fargo page that will attempt to collect her login information for her bank account. What do you think? Were any of these emails more convincing to you than the others? Can you imagine you or somebody you know clicking on the links in these emails or replying to them? Social engineering threat number four is phone calls. Social engineering can happen out in the physical world too, not just in the cyber world. We've already seen the example of the malicious USB drives left outside at the bank. Social engineers will also use things like phone calls to trick people into accepting malware onto their computers. In one common tactic, an attacker will call a target claiming to be a representative of a popular software company or an IT professional from the victim's work, school, or internet service provider. They might claim that the target's computer has been compromised. Or they might pretend to offer the victim a free software checkup or a free trial of a new security program. Their goal is to smooth talk the victim into sharing sensitive information and granting permission for the attacker to remotely access the target's computer. Once the attacker has remote access to the computer, they can install malware on it or perform any number of other sinister deeds. Now, so far, we've mostly been talking about using social engineering to spread malware. But, of course, attackers can use social engineering for other sinister purposes as well. Another common use for social engineering is phishing scams. Phishing scams are scams where an attacker uses some kind of bait to trick a victim into sharing sensitive personal information, like social security numbers or login information for bank accounts. 
So remember, there's other issues besides just malware. Social engineering can be used for a good old fashioned scam. Okay, in this video we've discussed four potential social engineering threats. Instant messages, fake antivirus, emails, and phone calls. And remember, social engineers prey on emotions when people are most vulnerable, and scammers are willing to stoop to the lowest possible level. No scam is so sleazy that some social engineer wouldn't be willing to try it. There's really no way to avoid being exposed to social engineering. You're probably going to encounter it someday in some form or another. What you can and should do is become familiar with the different flavors of social engineering so that you notice when you're being scammed, and so that you'll take a moment to reflect skeptically on the scam. Your emotions are going to try to convince you to participate by downloading a file or clicking on an enticing link, but sometimes your emotions will lead you astray. Slow down and think about what you're doing. That's all for now on social engineering. In the next lesson, I